So the last time we met, we were discussing the uh, Revolution of 1800, which um, at this point you should know led to the election of Thomas Jefferson, and it demonstrated that America was a nation of laws and you know the the glory of this uh, bloodless uh, bloodless transfer of power. What we need to talk about today is the Jeffersonian presidency specifically. Now, for my money, Jefferson, he's certainly not alone, but he gets a little bit too much credit for his presidency, um, at least if you ask me. But um, this is going to be an opportunity to, to kind of enact his vision. And, and keep in mind, what Jefferson wanted to give us was a nation of small landowning farmers. He felt that this would prevent industrial dependency, and he also felt that this would lend itself to independence. Uh, the only way that you could get men to be virtuous, according to Jefferson, is if they were independent. And if they, uh, they did not own any land, then they could never be independent. That's where I want to begin our conversation here today. Um, you cannot talk about Jefferson without talking about the West. You'll see exactly what I mean here in just a moment. But for the time being, understand that much of Jefferson's conversation as it relates to the West will involve what, what will ultimately happen to Native Americans. Now, this is not anything new in our class. We've talked about Native Americans. Um, I told you that uh, you know a very important turning point is going to come with the American Revolution, when the British uh, throw in that deal sweetener, uh, not only will you, the original 13 colonies, be granted your freedom, uh, but so too will we include um, all that land west of the Appalachian Mountains. The Native Americans have been watching this play out because ultimately this is really going to be determinative when it comes to their ability to hold on to their land, their ancestral lands, in what might loosely be called the Great Lakes region. Now, one thing that I need you to understand here is that there, there is a, there's a temporary peace treaty that's put into place that is interpreted very differently by two different groups of people. The treaty that I'm talking about would be the Treaty of Greenville. Uh, if you're looking at the slide here with me, it's at the bottom of that slide, 1795. This is actually before Thomas Jefferson is even sworn in as president. In any case, um, Native Americans interpreted that very, very differently than, um, than, than the American government did. The biggest implication for America's victory over the British in the Revolutionary War would be ultimately what would happen to that land west of the Appalachian Mountains. What the Treaty of Greenville said was, at least the way that the Natives heard this, you give us what would become the future state of Ohio, what we'll do from the American government perspective is we will stay out of your hair. Um, the American government, what it meant, or at least what it came to mean, was if you give us what will become Ohio, we will stay out of your hair for the time being, right? They, they heard this as a temporary peace offering, but eventually they had every intention of taking that land, both the Great, Great Lakes region and, and, and south of that as well. So ultimately what you get, guys, is how are we going to deal with these people that are indigenous peoples? Um, what will become of them? That, that's going to be an important question. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about once we get to the very next lecture. For right now, I want to talk a little bit about the diversity of thought. There was a guy at the bottom of the screen there, a guy by the name of Henry Knox, that favored assimilation for Native Americans and potentially even citizenship rights. In other words, simply fold them into the main body politic and make them part of the American political body. This was not a very popular idea. Um, a far more popular idea, tragically, would be that of another military man, a guy by the name of General Wayne, uh, uh, Anthony Wayne, or as he was sometimes known, Mad Anthony Wayne, um, hero of the Battle of uh, Fallen Timbers. But what Wayne argued was that these individuals should simply just be exterminated. Um, they were standing in the way of American expansion, and therefore they, they could never be assimilated. He thought that Henry Knox's idea of assimilating them as citizens was completely crazy, and so therefore they should simply be exterminated. It's racist. It's um, you know, it, it's 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 Eurocentric. 
it certainly drives at the concept of genocide, definitely it con uh, drives at the concept of colonization, but this was a very widespread belief during this period, um, or at least a lot more widespread than we might care to remember. But this does ultimately drive at Thomas Jefferson's vision for America, which will become a nation of small land-owning farmers. More immediately problematic for the Jefferson presidency, however, would be a Supreme Court ruling, not really Supreme Court, but appeals court ruling, that will come to be known as Marbury versus Madison. If you recall John Adams, and um, his Sedition Act especially. He was not especially a popular president, especially toward the end of his presidency. And he is defeated by Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Now, I know that you know that elections are not instantaneous. It's not as if Jefferson was elected and then tomorrow he's being sworn in as president. It took some time, just like it does today. So the Adams administration is a lame duck administration, but it's still got some power. And what you see it happening, what you see happening in 1801, is a new law called the Judiciary Act. Before your notes, what the Judiciary Act did was appoint 16 brand new judges to the federal appeals courts. Um, keep in mind, it's the president that will appoint justices, including these 16, as they were called at the time, midnight appointees, it's pretty clear what Adams is up to. What he's trying to do is preserve some of those laws that he felt very, very strongly about when he was president, Alien Act, Sedition Act, those sorts of things. And what better way to do that than to appoint individuals to the justice system that think and look at the world the way that you do. So this is pretty clearly what he's up to with one individual that sees this for what it is, is the newly appointed um, uh, Secretary of State, a guy by the name of James Madison. James Madison is so furious at John Adams and his administration for doing this that what he does is he refuses to deliver these new judgeships. Um, he says something to the effect of, I know what you're up to, and I'm not going to see you, you know, succeed in that. And one of those individuals that was appointed was a guy named John Marbury, who is going to sue James Madison for breach of duty uh, in 1801. He's going to sue him in federal appeals court, and he's going to win. This court case is going to come to be known as Marbury versus Madison. And in this decision, there are two things that are that are established. Um, one infinitely more important than the other. The first principle that is established is, um, as a sitting Secretary of State, you might not like um, these individuals that were being appointed. You, you, you might have your suspicions as to what John Adams was ultimately trying to do. But the fact of the matter is you have a legal obligation to deliver their judgeships, including John Marbury's judgeship. And so you need to go ahead and, um, and, and, and see that they take their seat on these judicial benches. Ultimately, they do, including John Marbury. So Marbury wins his case and he becomes an appeals judge. The other provision of the Marbury decision is going to be a lot more important. It's going to have a lot more implications for American history. And that is going to be the establishment of a Supreme Court. Now, if you read the Constitution, that there is no provision for establishing a Supreme Court. It's the Marbury versus Madison decision that establishes a Supreme Court. What Marbury ultimately leads to is the establishment of what you think of, as in right now, today, the Supreme Court. And it provides the Supreme Court with its basic check and balance of power on the other two branches of government, and that would be judicial review. Now, for those of you that don't know what judicial review means, is essentially a uh, review of the constitutionality, the legality of the laws that are coming out of Congress, and the policies that the president is, um, is, is, is shaping and pursuing. Um, if you've ever heard of the expression, the Supreme Court striking down um, a law, this is what people are talking about. Ultimately, what, this, the, what, what Marbury versus Madison will lead to is a Supreme Court that is going to be a co-equal branch of government in the American governmental system. Um, it's important because we don't start out that way. I mean, keep in mind, 
You've got that Judiciary Act of 1789 that sets up a series of appeals courts, but there's no one individual Supreme Court. And it's also a reason why when you, know, you see a Supreme Court decision that's being rendered, um, it's such a big deal. Um, once it is decided by the Supreme Court, it ultimately becomes the law of the land. Um, a good example as to what I'm talking about would be the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that essentially led to the legalization of what we call abortion. Um, there, there, there's a lot of fluidity to the understanding of the law until that 73 decision, but after 1973, for all intents and purposes, it's the Supreme Court that makes the institution of abortion legal in these United States. Um, are there good things about this? Yeah, um, the Supreme Court does provide that check and balance over the two other branches of government. And it has, um, it, it, it has pointed out in the past that there are times when uh, the, the Congress, for example, has overstepped its, uh, its, its constitutional authority. This is bad. Yeah, it also is bad. Um, judicial review, you can say what you want about it, but nowhere under the concept of judicial review does it say that the Supreme Court ought to be making policy or ought not to strike down laws. And, and clearly, those are, those are things that have happened within our lifetime. We're not, we're not talking about the, uh, the, the far off distant past. If you think about it carefully, my guess is you can probably think of an example where the Supreme Court essentially made a law or knocked down a law. Um, not only does the Supreme Court uh, not really exist in the framing of the Constitution, like, like we typically think of the executive branch or the, uh, the legislative branch, um, it certainly doesn't have this power that's vested in it, and, and it's functioning as such um, on, on a number of different occasions. And, and certainly you're going to see some of those examples in, in our class. This is a controversial element of the Jeffersonian presidency. Um, ultimately, Thomas Jefferson will accept the legitimacy of the Marbury decision, and he doesn't move against it. Now, I'm not saying that it would have been a great idea to essentially tell the court system in the Marbury decision that, uh, hey, I'm just not going to follow your decision. What I am saying is that there are then presidents, I'll introduce you one a little bit later in the semester named Andrew Jackson, that pretty much say, you can decide whatever you want to decide. I'm going to do my thing when it comes to the implementation of my policy. Um, I think that allowing the Marbury decision to be grounded in what would come to be thought of as legitimacy is is, is essentially going to establish challenges for us as a people as our history continues to unfold. But back to Jefferson and the West. Early on in his presidency, um, Jefferson was very concerned about the French presence in the Caribbean. Um, in the island nation that would come to be known as Haiti, uh, there was a slave revolt led by a man by the name of Louverture Toussaint. And ultimately, they will throw the French out of um, uh, the, the island nation. It was a sugar island. And they will rename it um, uh, Haiti. By the early 19th century, Napoleon Bonaparte had come to power in France, uh, one of the greatest military minds in human history. And he wanted the island nation back. Um, if you've been following along with us, uh, sugar is very good for business. It, it makes a lot of money, and so you can understand why he would want that back. But essentially, he's got the French Navy in the Caribbean, a hop, skip, and a jump away from American shores. And naturally, this worried Thomas Jefferson. Um, Napoleon had this reputation, not only a great military mind, but conquering a vast swath of Europe. As a matter of fact, at this particular moment, he does have a, quite the vast European empire. And so what Jefferson is concerned about is what is he planning on doing to the North American mainland? So to that end, what he did is he sent an American delegation to Paris to, to see if Bonaparte would be interested in selling the port city that the French actually own and control right now, New Orleans. Well, as it turned out, Napoleon was strapped for cash, and not only was he interested in selling New Orleans, he was interested in selling the entirety of uh, what was at the time known as Louisiana. Now I'm going to mouse over the map that you're looking at at the bottom of the screen there so that you can see what I'm talking about 
in this vast region right up here, right, it's the lightly tan shaded area. This is what was referred to as Louisiana. If you think uh, northwest of the present day city of New Orleans, you will have a very good idea as to what I'm talking about. Thomas Jefferson effect effectively purchases Louisiana from the French in 1804. This becomes known as the Louisiana Purchase. Now, we got Louisiana for a song of a price. We, it, was, it was highway robbery. I'll explain what I mean here in a second. But I need you to understand the potential that Jefferson sees for this. Keep in mind that what Jefferson wanted to establish was a nation of small landowning farmers. And purchasing a massive stretch of land like the Louisiana Territory that would be really, really good to that end. And, and, and that's really where he's going in the aftermath of the purchase of what at the time was known as Louisiana. Here's the thing, though. Um, part of the reason that he got the land so cheap uh, was because Napoleon did not know what he was selling. It could have been some of the most fertile farmland, as it turned out to be, in the history of the planet, or it could have been chicken soup, and, and nobody just knew for sure. It was claimed by the French, but uh, they, they governed over it very, very lightly. And the bottom line was, most of the French are just doing business with the Native Americans as opposed to uh, essentially setting up shop in a brick-and-mortar sort of approach. Um, the other thing is, is that, that you need to keep in mind is the fact that Jefferson did not know what he was buying. Again, it could have been valuable farmland, and maybe not. So to figure out exactly what it was that we just bought... Um, he commissions two of his old military buddies, a uh, guy by the name of Meriwether Lewis and uh, a friend by the name of William Clark, to, to lead an expedition. Um, this is going to come to be known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. What they're going to do is they're going to follow the contours of the Missouri River. Again, I'm leading you over here with, uh, with the mouse to give you an idea as to where this expedition is going to go, and their goal, guys, is the Pacific Ocean, right? A um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, number one, uh, they're trying to get a good understanding of exactly what they just bought, how big it was, and what the land was uh, was like. And, and the other thing that Thomas Jefferson and other people just insisted was there was a super highway system to China. Um, we find out that ultimately that's not the case, but we do find the ocean uh, eventually as well. So these guys are going to leave from, um, uh, from, from what is St. Louis, Missouri today, and they're going to go on a months-long expedition. It's almost like a magical mystery tour in the sense that uh, they're, they're, they don't know what they're going to run into next. I mean, it's, it's, it really is the unknown. Um, they're... They're, they're going to be going much, much longer than anybody um, feels is going to be necessary if they actually were to survive. And, and weeks and weeks and weeks um, before they got back, they had long been given up for dead. Uh, it was thought that uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition had uh, run into some trouble or died in some, 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 some way, and uh, they had been given up for, for dead. And when they got back and they presented Thomas Jefferson with their findings, ultimately what they did was they, they, they gave us accurate maps, accurate descriptions of what we just bought. Uh, we got reports on the fauna and the flora that like to grow in the middle part of uh, what is now the United States. We got a good understanding of exactly how fertile that land was, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we got an idea as to how big uh, this nation was. Last, and certainly not least, we got an understanding of the inhabitants of that region. And by inhabitants, of course, I mean the Native Americans. Um, for the most part, I think it can be said that without the, without the help and hospitality of the Mandans and uh, some of the other local groups in that part of the uh, continent, there's a very good chance that Lewis and Clark never would have come back. Um, and, and so the point that I'm making with this is that uh, not only is it very valuable, very fertile farmland, it's also a region that, um, although it is inhabited by Native Americans, most of those Native Americans um, are, are, are pretty docile, are pretty peaceful. And so you take all these revelations back to the East, 
um, back to a society that has really begun to just look at the West as opportunity for expansion in more ways than one. And it was like, you know, throwing a lit match on a puddle of gasoline. Uh, people desperately wanted to go West. And as Frederick Jackson Turner, um, a historian of the late 19th century, would later um, proclaim, the West is going to become the driving force in American history. But to sum up and conclude, guys, what, what I want you, what I want to leave you with is the idea that Thomas Jefferson had. Jefferson thought that he had a, uh, created an empire for liberty. As it turns out, three of these states that will ultimately be organized into the country, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri, they're going to become slave states. Um, in, in that way, Jefferson certainly did not create an empire for liberty, but an empire for slavery. And the West, broadly defined, is going to continue to have this sort of connection to American history. And, 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 and you'll see this in the 1840s with the war with Mexico. Um, when the United States emerges victoriously, um, the f thought is that the, the empire of slavery, and cotton in particular, could be exported into what is now commonly referred to as the Southwest. And so this is kind of a legacy in, in good ways and in bad ways when it comes to Jefferson and how he looked upon um, his purchase of the Louisiana Territory. We will pick it up um, with foreign policy in American life the next time we meet. But for right now, that's all I have.